Ismi Markanis Wahazihi Hayati. So I, I am the grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. My mom's mom was eight years old and when Hitler took over Austria, she was an orphan and she was able to get refuge in Britain when the British government only gave refuge to Jews who were 16 years or younger. So she and her five-year-old brother were able to make it to London and there they went into foster care. And when the Nazis started bombing London, uh, the British government moved all children, Jews and non-Jews, further north. So my grandmother and her brother made their way up to Glasgow, Scotland. And there she grew up and she met and married another Holocaust survivor. And they had three daughters. The middle one is my mom, who was born and raised in Glasgow, Scotland. And when she was 17, she immigrated to the United States to live the American dream. On my dad's side, his father was uh, in Auschwitz, one of the concentration camps. And at the end, he tried to get refuge in the United States, but was denied entry. He then tried in Cuba and was denied entry, and a few other countries, and finally made his way to Ecuador in South America. And there he met another Holocaust survivor. They got married and had one son, my dad, who was born and raised in Ecuador. And he came to the United States, uh, was visiting, and met my mom. And they got married and decided to raise a family in Quito, Ecuador. And so my sister and I grew up for 18 years in Quito, Ecuador. As Jews, we belonged to the one synagogue in the country and there was about a hundred families. It was a very small Jewish community in Ecuador. Everyone there is uh, Roman Catholic. And every service that I would go to for uh, Shabbat or for High Holidays, the survivors would tell us two things. They said, first, never forget what happened during the Holocaust. Never forget what the Nazis did uh, to the Jews and to others. And two, and just as important, Never, ever let it happen again. Doesn't matter if you're Jewish, doesn't matter if you're from Ecuador, if you're from America, doesn't matter. Never let it happen again. So when I was 18, I graduated high school and came to the United States to go to college. And so I enrolled in Swarthmore College near Philadelphia. And when I was in the cafeteria, I uh, saw an, a newspaper article about Darfur with my friends and it was talking about all the atrocities happening in, in the western region of Sudan and how this was the first time ever in history uh, that the United States government declared a conflict a genocide. So my friends and I said uh, we, we have to do something, we refuse to be bystanders to genocide. So we uh, as good students, skipped class and uh, didn't allow our schooling to interfere with education uh, and went to the library and went to the internet to Google and we typed in Sudan and John Jaweed to learn more about what was happening in Darfur and Sudan. And there uh, we started doing more research to learn about the conflicts. Uh, and these are the three reasons why we fail and why we will continue to fail to stop uh, genocide and mass atrocities, and that is protection, political will, and permanency. So the protection part is that when people hear about Darfur or Rwanda or the Holocaust, they tend to treat it, their brain gets the information and tends to put it in the same bucket in the same way as looking at the tsunami or Katrina, and that is to treat genocide and mass atrocities like humanitarian crises. And that is a fundamental problem, that is a big mistake, because genocide is all man-made. Um, but because we treat it like a natural disaster, like the tsunami or, or a famine, we respond to it. 
like a natural disaster. And that's by giving money to humanitarian aid, giving food, giving medicine, giving blankets. And that's good and important, but that's just the, it's not the, the best and only response that people should be giving to genocide. People want protection. And so we need to stop treating genocide like a humanitarian crisis and start treating it like a security crisis and focusing on protecting civilians. The second is political will, and that is when you ask any public official, any president of the world, any foreign minister about what did you know and what did you do during all these past genocides, they will always use the same two excuses, and that is we didn't know or we didn't have the ability to do anything. And in every genocide, that is just false. It is not true. Um, the world has the ability to stop genocide. So the question is why? Why do all these countries, why does the United States fail when it knows and it has the ability to do something about it? Uh, and the answer is simple. The answer is that there is zero political cost to an action. There's not one public official in the United States and the world that will ever lose a vote or a campaign contribution, money, to run their campaigns to, to, to be elected if they do nothing when it comes to genocide or mass atrocities. And the only way we're able to make never again mean something, the only way we're going to prevent and stop genocide is if people get political about stopping genocide and they demand action from their public officials. The third and final P is a connection from the previous one and that is we need to create a permanent anti-genocide constituency. It's weird but every single genocide after the genocides are over and politicians from the United States and from the rest of the world say never again will we allow this to happen. Uh, their their uh, citizens believe them. We always dissolve these organizations after the genocides are over. So we need to create a permanent anti-genocide organization. So my friends and I, uh, they were, it started with me and uh, my friend Andrew Snyderman, who's a Canadian, uh, and we recruited some other friends, decided to take these conclusions on why the U.S. and the world fail at stopping genocide and change it. We started with the idea of fundraising for peacekeepers. There was lots of news coming out of Darfur that there were peacekeepers from Africa that were willing to put their lives on the line to help protect Darfurians, but they didn't have the resources to protect them. So you had Rwandan troops who were, many of them victims of the genocide, saying, I, will, I want to help protect others from genocide, but I don't have boots, I don't have walkie-talkies, I don't have maps. Or I don't even have a plane to help get me from Rwanda to Darfur. So we decided, Andrew and I, when we started, to write a letter to the, newspaper, to the newspaper, maybe the New York Times, maybe the Washington Post, saying, hey, why, why can't citizens raise money to help peacekeepers? Um, we're really good at raising money for humanitarian aid, but why not get people to raise money to help uh, African Union peacekeepers to help protect people in Darfur? So we wrote a letter to the newspaper, but we knew when, when we started as students that a newspaper probably wouldn't publish our letter to the editor. So um, we decided to get some academic, someone who has a PhD in Holocaust or genocide studies, to be the author of the op-ed. So we got on Google and started uh, finding anyone who was an academic on this issue you know, at Harvard or Yale or any of these other places and email them and say, hey, what do you think of this idea of citizens fundraising for peacekeepers to stop a genocide? Has this happened before? If so, what happened? Uh, if it hasn't happened, why hasn't it happened? You know, we were just starting. We didn't know. Um, so we emailed them this letter and uh, asked them to put their name on it and we would submit it to newspapers to get it published because they were experts on this issue, they'd be taken seriously and they might get published. 
So uh, we just spent, stopped going to classes, stopped doing our homework, uh, just sitting in front of Google and our email, just emailing all these professors saying, uh, will you publish this op-ed? And there were a few who replied to us. Some said, good idea, good luck. Uh, or some said, bad idea, you're taking away responsibility from governments, don't do this. Um, so we were frustrated with the response from academics. Um, so then we started emailing policymakers, current and former policymakers. So I started emailing the first President Bush, uh, President Carter, President Clinton, all their uh, cabinet members from the secretaries of state uh, to the p department, uh, their uh, secretaries of defense, asking them if what they thought of this idea and if they would submit the letter to the editor. Um, so, you know, I was trying to email Colin Powell, then Secretary of State. Is it just guessing on email? Is it cpowell at state.gov? Is it powell.c at state.gov? Uh, colon dot Powell? Just any and, and uh, options uh, to try to get to them. And we hit a big milestone. We hit our uh, success when a woman, Gail Smith, she was the Senior Director of African Affairs in the National Security Council under President Clinton. And she responded to our email and said, I don't want to write this op-ed. I think this is a great idea. I want to make this happen. So Gail offered to fly to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia and ask all the generals of the African Union if they would take money from two students at Swarthmore College in Philadelphia to help them stop genocide in Darfur. And so she flew over to Ethiopia and said that there are these two students that want to help stop genocide by raising money. Uh, would they take the money? And they were shocked. Uh, they were shocked that Americans knew uh, about Darfur, that they knew about the African Union, and not only that, that they actually wanted to help them stop genocide. Uh, and they'd never taken money from private citizens before. They only take gov money from governments. So they said, we need to meet about this, we need to discuss it, and we'll get back to you. Um, so they, they got back to Gail Smith, uh, and no big surprise, they agreed to take money uh, to support their efforts to stop the genocide in Darfur. And uh, so Gail came back uh, and emailed us when we were still in college and said, I've opened up a bank account. There is zero, there's no money in it. Uh, uh, the African Union is willing to take your money. Uh, start fundraising. All of a sudden we went from writing a letter to a newspaper to uh, making the idea a reality. So we got on email and Facebook and MySpace and anything else on the internet we had to contact our friends and ask them to contact their friends and we said, hey, we just, have, we just uh, got the African Union to agree to take uh, funding to help them stop genocide. Can you raise money in your, in your schools, on your campuses, get your grandmothers, get your grandfathers and your parents and your friends to raise money so we can help peacekeepers stop genocide, protect people? Everyone said that they would, they would find ways to raise money. And so we launched a campaign called 100 Days of Action. Um, to shame the hundred days of the inaction of the Rwandan genocide. You know, in Rwanda, in a hundred days, they killed close to a million people, uh, and the world did nothing. Uh, that's, that's the equivalent of two 9-11s every day for a hundred days, and the world did nothing in 1994. It wasn't that long ago. So we tried to shame people for not doing anything in Rwanda to take an opportunity to take uh, action to help people in Darfur. Um, by raising money and pressuring their politicians to take action. So in a hundred days we raised close to a quarter of a million dollars from students across the country and non-students to help the African Union peacekeepers protect Darfurians from genocide. Um, so that's how we started with, uh, uh, first went from the idea into reality uh, and we continued from, from then on uh, to creating the Genocide Intervention Network. So what we decided is to keep on raising money for peacekeepers, but the other important component is to build 
the first permanent anti-genocide constituency. So we asked our friends, their friends, anyone in the United States to become a member of Genocide Intervention Network um, so that as a member they could tell their politician that their votes and their campaign contributions are going to matter on how they take action or they, if they don't take action in response to Darfur. So four of us barely graduated to Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, we, we grew facial hair, so it'd be taken seriously. Um, and so we uh, uh, opened up an office uh, in Washington for Genocide Intervention Network and started asking people to raise money and become members of GINET so we could stop the genocide in Darfur and prevent future genocides wherever they happen. At Genocide Intervention Network, our mission is to empower people with the tools to prevent and stop genocide. And we focus on three main tools, education, advocacy, and fundraising. So on the education part, it's vital that people know what's happening because you can't stop a genocide if you don't know what's happening. So we work with uh, multiple different organizations to raise awareness about what's happening in Darfur so then people can learn what's happening and then say, what can I do to help uh, stop this genocide? So we do multiple things. So we work with a Save Darfur coalition uh, that does lots of advertising on TVs and radio and newspapers to tell people what's happening in Darfur. Um, we also work with journalists and give them information if they want to know more information so that they can write about it or talk about it on radio and TV and uh, newspapers. Um, we also did a campaign talking about how uh, the media in the United States is not covering Darfur as much as they should. So we did a campaign uh, called Be a Witness and we looked at the airtime that the five major TV networks in the United States uh, cover Darfur, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and Fox. How much airtime in June 2005 did these TV stations give to Darfur, which at that time was, uh, had a lot of violence, a lot of killing of innocent civilians, versus Michael Jackson's trial, Tom Cruise's engagement, and uh, the runaway bride, this woman who wanted to avoid getting married. While they show us this. Michael Jackson's lawyers rested their case. This. Filed criminal charges against the so-called runaway bride after faking her own abduction. And this. But some are wondering if the engagement of Tom Cruise with and actress Katie Holmes. To... This is happening. You can't stop a genocide if you don't know about it. Genocide is news. Tell the media to be a witness. So we created a website called BeAWitness.org and asked people to email the TV station saying, hey, I learned about Darfur and genocide is newsworthy. This is important. I want to learn more about it and I want more people to learn more about it so that we can take action and stop this genocide. I want you to cover Darfur more than Michael Jackson's trial. And so we got 30,000 people to email the networks and we started getting more news coverage um, from radio stations covering more about Darfur to TV stations. Uh, Ann Curry uh, flew to Darfur um, and started covering this. There were journalists uh, covering more about it. I know Al Hura started talking more, uh, did coverage, but was talking more about this campaign uh, to talk about genocide as newsworthy. Um, another way that we raise awareness is that we've created chapters. Uh, we've started it on colleges. Um, we've called them stand chapters. So students in colleges, and now we've gone to high schools and middle schools and elementary schools, have, got, have created clubs called stand where they uh, raise awareness. They show movies, uh, Hotel Rwanda, Schindler's List, um, The Killing Fields, to raise awareness about what's, ha what's, what's genocide and what's happening in Darfur. Um, and then they invite speakers to come and speak on campus. So I, I often go to high schools and colleges to speak about what's happening in Darfur. Um, or they invite other experts to come and speak. And now we're trying to do this in synagogues and churches and mosques to raise awareness about Darfur so that no one can ever use the excuse, which is what they did and what they have used in the past of why they didn't take action during the Holocaust or uh, Cambodia, Iraq, Rwanda, and that was that they didn't know it was happening. So we want to eliminate this excuse that people can never say they didn't know what was happening.
And the final way that we do that is with our website, uh, genocideintervention.net, where people can log on and see, uh, get news about what's happening in Darfur and other areas of the world. We compile the news every week so that to save people time, uh, so that they can read the biggest updates of what's happening on the ground. Uh, my parents, my parents are extremely proud of, of what I do. Um, it gives, you know, uh, I exist and my parents are alive because, because my grandparents were able to survive the Holocaust. We were fortunate that the world, you know, even though very late uh, into World War II, into the Holocaust, were able to help protect and liberate the concentration camps and liberate the Jews. Um, so my parents are very proud that uh, I've decided to focus on the worst crime against humanity, genocide. Ismi Marcanis Wahazihi Hayati.